about 12 different reasons why being on the savannah made us buy keto, or why the, being on the savannah made us naked, or why being on the savannah made us able to talk. But they were all agreed that that was what had made the difference. There was only one man who had a different idea, and his name was Alistair Hardy. If we're talking about God and creation, Alistair Hardy was a man who, from the time he was a boy, was in love with God and in love with Darwin, and he thought he would devote his life to bringing these two things together so you could believe in God and Darwin. And he had this strange idea. He came back from the South Seas exposition when he was quite young, 30, and he read a book by Frederick Wood Jones which says that the difference between man and the apes is that man has got a layer of fat attached to the underside of his skin. If you cut open an ape, or most animals, you get skin and then muscle. But in man, you get this layer of fat. And Wood Jones said we have no idea why it's there because it's not true of any other animal. But Alistair thought, yes, it is. I've just come from the South Seas and looked at aquatic mammals. And if you cut a seal open, there's a layer of fat. If you cut a dugong open, there's a layer of fat. And he thought perhaps our ancestors had developed the layer of fat because they had spent some time in a semi-aquatic environment. And he looked at nakedness. And he thought, who are the naked mammals? As Darwin himself had said, but never followed it up, there's the whale and there's the dugong, and there's the walrus, and there's the hippopotamus. Perhaps we became naked for the same reason that they became naked. Nobody believed him. And one, the other thing about bipedalism, he said, if you were a, an ape walking on your knuckles and you started to go into the water, the time would soon come as the water gets deeper, you've got to stand up on your hind legs because you want to breathe. If you stay on four legs, your head is under the water. And Attenborough had beautifully illustrated that with pictures of apes and monkeys. That is the one condition which causes them all to stand up and walk on their hind legs is wading through water. He uh, sat on this theory for 30 years before letting it out. When he did let it out, everybody came down on him like a son of bricks and said, don't be so silly, never do that again. You're betraying the reputation of Oxford University and you're only a marine biologist. You've got no reason to talk about any people anyway. You don't know anything about people. So they said, never do that again. And he never did. He only published ever two articles about it. But I published it. I published that book because I, that I think that Alistair Hardy had it right. And since then I've published six other books saying I think Alistair Hardy had it right. I think it explains nakedness. I think it explains bipedalism. We've got a descended larynx. No other primate has got a descended larynx, but you can find it in aquatic mammals. We've got this fat layer under our skin. We've got babies born with five times as much fat of a, as a baboon baby or any other primate baby. What is that all about? We are the only ma land mammals that have got best control, which enables us to speak because you cannot teach a gorilla, not only not speak, you can't teach him to say, ah, because his breath is unconsciously control the way ours is when we were asleep. We have got to decide to take in some breath, let it out slowly, and then we can say words with it. Um, it doesn't mean to say that that, this, that that breath control was sufficient to enable us to speak, but without that, we never could have learned to speak. It was an essential precondition. And then people said, well, uh, but the other naked mammals, I mean, what about elephants? They, they, they were never in the water. And I honestly believe I was the first one in 1980 to say, I think perhaps their ancestors lived in the water. And by now, 
everybody accepts that their ancestors did live in the water. But however much evidence I brought out, they would say, we don't need that. We know why we're different. They're different because of the savannah. That's where all the <coughs> skeletons are. Until the 1990s. You've heard, I'm sure you've heard about the savannah theory, but you may not have heard that the savannah theory had been disproved by the scientists themselves. They have looked more closely at the hominid skeletons and the things surrounding them. And the little animals surrounding them are animals that live in woodlands. And they have learned a way to analyze the pollen, the fossilized pollen that is with these human, uh, early human skeletons. And the pollen is of plants that are grown in woodland, even including the pollen of lianas, those long dangly things that you only get in deep forest. So the savannah theory was wrong. Did you read the headlines? No, you didn't read the headlines. It never hit the headlines. They have kept very quiet about it. In the professional journals, if you've got the patience and the knowledge to know where to look, you can find the admission that the savannah theory was wrong and they stopped using the word savannah. If not savannah, then what? Nobody's asking that question. Their response to this situation is being, they know they got it wrong, they're not saying so very loudly, if it wasn't the savannah, what made us different? There must be something else different. But there's nothing else there except the aquatic theory, which they don't like. So what is their response? Their response is, well, we won't talk about it at all. <laughs> and you have two great big encyclopedias, 500 pages long, describing human beings and never mentioning the fact that we are naked, never even hinting at it. Now, can you imagine if there was one species of bear that was naked, can you imagine anybody writing a whole book about this animal and not mentioning the fact that it was the only naked bear? No, you can't. There's something gone wrong inside their heads that they've forgotten about it, and they've forgotten, they've forgotten about it. And some of them, indeed, are saying not only we can't answer this question, but we should stop trying to answer this question. Aaron G. Filler from Harvard. Perhaps we need to stop wondering about selection pressures. Well, selection pressures is the only thing that Darwin was about. So that some of the scientific establishment, as well as the creationists, are saying, perhaps we need to stop asking the Darwinian question. Well, in 2009, 2009, we're living through the year of Darwin. Nobody is asking that question. If you ask, why don't you believe in the aquatic theory, you are liable to be told, oh, but they held an investigation years ago and they proved it was wrong. I mean, can't keep on digging it up and doing it all over again. So the investigators did they? I've been spending 25 years trying to find out who investigated it, where this meeting was held, where they reported it, and I have come to the conclusion that it's like one of those urban myths. Everybody who tells you this sincerely believes it because they've been told it by people they have the utmost respect for, but I don't believe that it ever happened. And I would like, sometime before the end of this year, either that somebody would tell me where it happened, and I deeply apologize, or that they'd admit it never happened, and in that case, it's time it did. So 